May the Noble Triple Gem bless you all. So before we begin today's sermon, let us pay our homage to the Noble Triple Gem by chanting the Namaskara three times. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa how have you been during the last month? If you can remember what we discussed in the last session, we came across a very important concept. If you can recall it, we gave it a name, going in front of the mirror. I hope you tried to practice it in your day-to-day -day life life experiences. If you keep on continuing to practice this concept, you will see the depth of it. Because this is a concept where which empowers you to convert the unpleasantness into pleasantness, to convert your sadness into happiness. Therefore, it is very important for us to understand this in order to create a mindset to practice what Lord Buddha taught us. We will try to recall what we learned in the last session. Can you remember the case scenario that we took? Just imagine one of your friends, to be precise, your best friend, blames you for no reason. And how would you feel at that moment? You will be sad, obviously. But according to what we discussed in our last session, we try to see this scenario in a totally different way. We applied the concept of what you give is what you get. And we try to prove that concept using an evidence, a piece of evidence. So we discussed the evidence to prove what we get is what we have given in the first place. The evidence, the piece of evidence to prove that is the fact that we get something. If we get something, that itself proves that we have given it in the first place. Because, just imagine, you come to know that you are going to be blamed by someone. but that person has not yet blamed you. Can you say that you have blamed someone for no reason? No, because the evidence is still missing. But you can say so after being blamed, because you have already got it. If you have got something, then you have the evidence to prove that you have given it in the first place. Therefore, children, if you get something, anything, the fact that you get it proves that you have given the same thing at some point in your journey through the samsara. It might not be in this birth. It might be eons ago. We don't want to pinpoint and say, it is at this moment that we gave this. Whatever the time that is concerned, we have given it. How to prove it? Because we get it. There's only one way to get something. What is it? It is to give the exact same thing. 
without giving something it is impossible not it is difficult it is impossible to get it therefore children we have to realize we have to acknowledge with 100% conviction that if we get something that is the exact same thing that we have given it therefore we discussed in our previous session that to realize this we have to when we get something we have to realize that is the way that we have given it or we see how we gave it through what we get therefore we call this going in front of the mirror because what do you see in front of the mirror it will be your mirror image and you know for a fact that is just a mirror image and there's no one at the other side of the mirror it is just the reflection of the light rays that that are emitted from you therefore children the mirror is just a reflector and mirror image says a lot about you so if you see something wrong in the mirror image you don't blame at the mirror image you correct yourself likewise if you get something bad what does that imply that imply that you get it because you have given it because you have given it given something bad that is why we get something bad therefore children we have to improve this mentality or the mindset through practice if you can improve this ability to see what you have given at the very moment that you get something for if you apply this concept to the case scenario that we try to try to discuss if you can see yourself at the moment that you are being blamed through your best friend you have won it the challenge this is a challenge can you remember in our previous session we we discussed to see ourselves through the actions of the others what is the action of the other the other means your best friend the action of your best friend is the blaming and if you are wise enough to see yourself through that action you will see no one but yourself if you can see yourself the way how you gave it then you will tell yourself what have i given you don't have a slight of a doubt because it is being proven right in front of your eyes with the piece of evidence what is the piece of evidence the fact that you get it you are getting right in front of your eyes and you have the piece of evidence to prove that therefore now you have to agree to the fact that i have given it therefore i deserve this no one else should be responsible for this i deserve it because i acknowledge the fact that i have given this in the first place therefore children this is just a summary of what we discussed in our previous session we discussed that this is just the first step of going in front of the mirror there are few other steps as well so in our today's discussion we'll try to go a step further it is just the advancement of the step that we discussed what is it to see oneself or to see ourselves through the actions of the other that means although we get different kind of treatments from the society or from your friends or from your family or whoever whoever in front of us we see no one but ourselves 
Because if we get something, that means we have given it. But for the time being, we are only discussing if you get something bad, because that's the point where we get upset or the, where the mind becomes unpleasant. So we have to safeguard the mind from this unpleasantness because that is what gains the demerit. That is what it collects or gathers demerit. We have to safeguard the mind from this aspect or the unpleasantness. That is why we apply those kinds of case scenarios to apply this concept. Okay. When the mind becomes unpleasant, why do you think the mind becomes unpleasant? For example, in our case scenario, why do you get upset when your best friend blames like that for no reason? Because you see someone else. The answer to that question is that the inability to see ourselves through the actions of the others makes us upset. That is the reason for this unpleasantness in the mind. Therefore, children, if you practice this and if you can see yourself through the actions of the others, if you have the ability to do that, if the wisdom is improved to that extent, the mind can never be upset or the unpleasantness will never arise in the mind. Therefore, children, practice makes perfect. You already know that. So, what should we do then? We have to practice this. Practice, practice and practice. So, the first step is to see ourselves through the actions of the others. And we discussed in our previous session, it will redirect our index finger. Because before realizing that, our index finger was pointed at someone else. We love to do that. We love to find faults of the others. Isn't that so? That is the natural inclination of any mind. Not anyone is to be blamed for that. That is the nature of this mind. We have to practice the other wise. We have to practice the opposite in order to get rid from that natural inclination. Get rid of the mind. Therefore, if you practice this concept of going in front of the mirror, what you see is no one but yourself. Therefore, your index finger will be redirected back at yourself. Then you will tell yourself, I honestly, I honestly acknowledge that I deserve this kind of treatment because this is what I have given. Therefore, the index finger is directed back at myself because I am responsible. Children, we can broaden this concept a step further. Okay, children, now I'm going to ask you a question. Think very carefully and answer this in your minds, of course. If you do something wrong, mistakenly, would it be fair for you to get a punishment? Just imagine, if I did something wrong, Shouldn't I be punished for that? Is it fair or not? It will be fair because I am the one who did that mistake. Therefore, it is fair to be punished. Who? Me. If I asked you, is it fair to punish someone else for the mistake that I did? Is it fair? Obviously, you, your answer is going to be no, Swaminas, it's not going to be fair. 
see what happens here why is your friend blaming at you just imagine that i am being blamed by my best friend why am i getting that kind of treatment because i have given it in the first place therefore i am responsible for this treatment therefore it is my mistake that i am therefore i am being punished there is nothing wrong with it and there is nothing unfair in it but if you look that this case scenario in the other point of view that means from my friend's point of view isn't he being punished as well because he is committing a demerit to him to be precise he is doing the exact same mistake that once i did i started by doing this demerit and i underwent a whole lot of suffering thereafter and he is just starting it who should be responsible for that it's no one else who is it your friend no it's me because my dear children there's a reason for this you might say that the friend is blaming me therefore it is his responsibility therefore they should suffer but if you look closely if i hadn't done that mistake previously would he ever treat me like that think very carefully the treatment that i got why did i get that treatment because i deserved it that is the the thing that i have given not he has given it is i who gave it in the first place therefore my friend was just a portal for that treatment to be met by myself that means he just made it av- available for me it came through him in a way he is doing a service for me to consume all my de- demerit because once it is being resulted that will not be resulted anymore he is just enabling me for me to consume the demerit but what happens at the other end he is just starting the very mistake that i did and he he will suffer like me in the future who is to be blamed i am to be blamed because if i hadn't done that mistake in the first place he will never have treated me like that therefore the demerit that he is committing right now is also becomes my responsibility i am responsible for the demerit that he commits right in front of my eyes is it a children if you look under this light you will see therefore children although your friend doesn't sound anything valid because he blames he or she blames for no reason there is a reason for him to blame at you what is the reason because you have given the exact same thing and he is being the culprit because he is giving it right now and he is making himself eligible to get the same thing in the future therefore children i am responsible to save him because he is doing it because i gave it isn't it a good chance to make an apology for him because i am very sorry 
for the demerit that you commit right now. Because if I hadn't done that mistake in the first place, you will not commit this demerit. Therefore, I am sorry. Children, this is the second step of going in front of the mirror. Having an apologizing mindset. But this is a tricky step, dear children, because there are many reasons for one to take an apology, to make an apology. For example, if someone blames another, the other person can make an apology. Oh, I'm, I'm very sorry. Yes, I agree that I am responsible. Yes, it's, it was my mistake. Now you can be quiet. That is one way of making an apology. Dear children, you have to be very cautious. What is the reason behind your apology? If the reason is to making the other person quiet, that is not the right reason. That is not the correct reason for making that apology. You have to understand the correct reason to make the correct apology. The correct reason is that you acknowledge, that we acknowledge that we are responsible for the demerit that he or she commits right in front of our eyes. That is the reason. That is why I say, I am sorry for the demerit that you do. Because if I hadn't done the demerit or the mistake in the first place, you don't have to do it. Therefore, I am sorry. Then just another point, dear children. During the course of an endless sansara, do you think that the, only this friend gave that result to you, treated you like that? Is this the first time that someone has done this to you? This is not the first time. Countless other beings must have treated you like this, the same way that your friend is treating you. Therefore, all of them did the same mistake that you did, that you started with. Therefore, they all committed the same demerit because you were there. And isn't it, our, isn't it our responsibility to make an apology for all of them? If you are so determined to eradicate this suffering once and forever, you are a person who is trying to leave this world once and forever. Therefore, you have to pay all your debts before you go. If you are so determined to eradicate this suffering once and forever, there is one thing that we have to do. We have to acknowledge our mistakes and we have to make an apology. And this is how we do it. We have to apologize for the correct reason. So this is the second step. It's going to be tough, of course, I understand. Because lack of practice is what makes it difficult. It's not the thing that we have to do or the way how we have to think. The activity is not the difficult, is not the difficulty, it is the lack of practice. For example, have you seen those genius violinists? Those violinists, they play like, they very fluidly play. It almost appears as if the violin is part of their body. Because the, the, that violinist is so talented in playing the instrument. 
If you try to do that, if you try to play the violin for the first time, it will be difficult. Does that mean that activity or the act of playing the violin, is it difficult? If that is difficult, that difficulty should be there with that very talented violinist. But if you ask from him, he would say, no, it's very easy. Therefore, the difficulty is not with the activity. Something becomes difficult because of the lack of practice. Therefore, this activity is going to be difficult because we don't have enough practice. Therefore, children, if we practice this day in and day out in our day-to-day -day lives, this will become easier. If you become sad or if you, if you come across these kind of situations where you tend to be, your mind tend to be unpleasant or you become sad, give it a try. Start with the first step, going in front of the mirror, seeing yourself through the actions of the others. Then apologize for the correct reason. You are apologizing from the other because you have passed from the first step. That means you, are, you have already seen yourself through the actions of the others. In that first step, you have apologized yourself. Now is the time to apologize the others, to make an apology from the others. If you can honestly do this, you will see the world in a totally different perspective. And your mind will not be unpleasant. The mind will be pleasant. If the reason for this, for the demerit, for the mind to earn demerits is unpleasantness, the mind can never earn any demerit. Therefore, the mind will be safeguarded. This is how we safeguard the mind. This is the second step of going in front of the mirror. Making an apology for the correct reason. Not just from the one that is in front of you, but from all beings in all worlds. Because they have also committed the same mistake right in front of our eyes. Therefore, it is high time that we made an apology from all beings in all worlds with the correct mindset. Of course, if you, if you make an apology 100% honestly to your mind, you will tell yourself, I am responsible for what they do. Therefore, I should safeguard them all. I have to protect them. If I don't protect them, who else would? I will save them all. This will be the mentality if you practice this thing, practice this concept. Therefore, children, try to practice this. You will, you will gather more and more experience when you practice. If you don't practice, you won't get those experience. It's only through this experience that you can enhance yourself and you can develop yourself and you can progress further. Therefore, practicing is essential. That is why it is called practice of the path. It is not just contemplation of the path. No, it is the practice. That is why it is called practice of the path. It is the application of what you know in your day-to-day -day life experiences. So, dear children, today we have discussed the second step of applying this concept of what you give and is what you get and this contemplation of being in front of the mirror. We revised what we discussed in our previous session. 
we revised how to go in front of the mirror and how to see ourselves through the actions of the others. Then we progressed to the next step, that is to make an apology for the correct reason. We discussed why should we make an apology? Why are we responsible for others' demerit? We discussed it. When we analyze the reason why are we there, why we are responsible for others' demerits, we were convinced that we should make an apology. And we discussed there are many reasons to make an apology. And we have to be cautious to make the apology for the correct reason. Then we discussed that it is not only the person that is in front of us that did the same mistake. Because we have had the same experience with many other countless beings in this endless journey of sansar. Therefore, we broadened our apology not only to the person that is in front of us, but to all beings in all worlds. So this is the second step of going in front of the mirror. I hope you will practice this concept in your day-to-day -day life experiences and therefore your life will be more easy and your mind will not be unpleasant as before. Therefore, you protect your mind from gathering or from earning demerit because you prevent the mind, the causes for the mind to earn demerit. That is the unpleasantness. Through this practice, unpleasantness will not be there in the mind. Therefore, the mind will be safeguarded. Okay, then that brings us to the conclusion of today's sermon. So, let us all make a resolve that may through the power of these blessings and the merits that we earn today, all our ancestors, if they have born in the woeful plain, may they all be redeemed and be born in the blissful plain. May they all earn merits and fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the Noble Eightfold Path and attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. May the Noble Triple Gen bless you all.
ಸಹಿತ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ನಮೋ ತಸ ಭಗವತು ಅರ್ಹತು ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ ನಮೋ ತಸ ಭಗವತು ಅರ್ಹತು ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ ನಮೋ ತಸ ಭಗವತು ಅರ್ಹತು ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ Tiruvan Sarna everyone. Today we are going to talk about a great woman who was smart, intelligent and stood up for what was right and against bullying. She is none other than the senior nun, Venerable Badra Kundala Kesi Theri. In the time of the Lord Buddha Padumotara, a child was born to a family was very fond of the noble triple chan even as a young girl she enjoyed doing many meritorious deeds such as going to the monastery offering flowers and alms to the mahasangha one fine day she went to the temple and saw a nun standing to one side of the lord buddha as he was giving a discourse At the end of his talk he conferred the title foremost among nuns who are quick in comprehending dhamma to this nun the young lady was in awe at this sight she looked at this nun and aspired that day she would somehow become like that nun so at the end of the sermon she reluctantly went home with an abundance of determination she continued to do a lot of meritorious deeds every time hoping that one day she could become like that nun that nun had become her role model she continued to do this for the rest of her life and was born one of the great heavens upon her death in the time of the lord buddha gautama She was conceived into a wealthy merchant's family in the beautiful city of Rajgaha in the kingdom of Magadha. They gave her a very special name, Badra, which means auspicious. She grew up to be an extremely beautiful jasma. Despite her name, she was prophesized to do something horrendous. She was prophesized to fall in love with a wrong to her. Her parents were terrified and was determined to prevent it. Not seeing an escape from this devastating destiny, her parents trapped her on the top floor of a massive seven-story mansion, just like in the story of Rapunzel. On the day of Badra's birth something very special happened in the royal palace the king was startled awake sweat dripping from his forehead he had woken up from a nightmare the royal chaplain asked the king your highness did you sleep comfortably today the king replied explaining his dream and what he had seen the royal chaplain informed that it was a bad omen and not only the sword of his chamber but all the weapons in the entire city started to glow the king was confused and asked the chaplain if he knew why the royal chaplain explained your highness Last night my wife gave birth to a baby boy as good as that may be he's unfortunately to become an enemy to the entire city want to be rid of him we will do as you wish then the king most benevolently said there is no need of that that baby is still just an infant 
I suggest that let him grow up and live his life, but among the right associates. That day, that may change his fate. The chaplain decided to name the baby boy Satuka. Time passed by, and unfortunately, the two children's fate couldn't be avoided. In the royal chaplain's household, the young Saktuka grew up to be a strong and handsome boy, but he was very mischievous. He started to do fine pleasure in the thrill of stealing. It started as a small habit of petty things, but the joy was addictive. And as he grew older, thieving the items of his nefarious desires became increasingly precarious. His desire was insatiable, and he could not control himself or what he stole. Soon, his kleptomaniac habits were discovered by his family, and they tried to stop him. They even restored to punishment. But Satuka kept breaking the rules. His father, after a while, saw that he was a lost cause and the punishments were utterly pointless. So they did this one thing they could do to their son and turned a blind eye. Satuka was now free to do as he pleased. He started to ransack every single house in the city. The king ordered his mayor to capture. Satuka was as smart as waiting, getting caught as he was at stealing. He could stay hidden from the masses of search parties and throw them of his trail. After the mayor's many failed attempts, a group of men planned a trap. The men, led by the mayor, surrendered the house and all exits in which he was in and finally caught him. Satuka had no trail and was sentenced to death he was condemned to be thrown off a cliff. The day finally came for Satuka to die a horrible death. The guards pulled him out of his prison. He was hopeless with his hands tied behind his back and two spears millimeters from his bare back. They had a long way to go, though the south gate of the kingdom and all the way up a mountain as well. At the first crossroad, they stopped and the mayor turned around and revealed a whip in his hand. The streets were filled with deafening lashes of the whip and the agonizing screams and groans of Satuka. Every time his knees buckled from the pain and exhaustion, the spear prodded him to keep walking towards. At that time, Princess Badra heard a massive commotion. People were screaming, shouting, gasping, crying, and some were even laughing. He opened her window and glanced out to see what it was all about. Many people were there, parading down the street. She saw an opening in the crowd. There was, a, there was the mayor and behind him, stumbling alone, was a young man. The moment her eyes 
saw this strange man, her heart skipped a beat. It was as if she had known the person many lifetimes ago. With both hands on her panting heart, she, she felt onto the bed. He, her eyes were beaming with tears and her heart burned with sorrow. It was as if this mysterious man had a sansaric connection with her. She felt as though she was stuck. There was no escape from this pit of sorrow he was fa falling into. A depression was swallowing her up. The sound of the commotion seemed to fade away, but she could no longer function properly. She couldn't eat, sleep or even smile. And as that family's only child and loving daughter, they couldn't bear to see her like this. Her mother tried everything she could do to cheer her up. She relentlessly tried to reassure her. Darling, what are you doing? Why aren't you eating? Why? What is wrong? Why are you sad? She replied with her heart in her throat. Terrillium poisoning her mind. Mother, did you see that thief outside? There is something about him. I don't know what, but all I know is that I can only survive if I can be with him for the rest of my life. Her loving parents tried to convince her otherwise. But no matter what they said, Badra refused to eat or do anything. Her parents were worried and in the end, they realized that with a foolish persistence, she would surely die. A regret for life is much better than death. They thought, but now they needed to stop the boy from dying. The father, in that instant, went directly to the mayor, pulled him aside and tried to negotiate. Honorable sir, please give me a few moments and listen to my humble request. Look, there are 1,000 gold coins in this bag. Please, sir, I want you to take it. And in return, I want you to do something for me. Good, sir. My daughter has fallen in love and I need to have the man. You see, she wouldn't eat, drink or function. She wouldn't be able to live unless we grant her this wish. Take this money and free him from me. Take this money and free him from me. May realized that he was talking about the thief, was surprised his daughter was a fool. He considered the amount of money he was about to receive, which is millions in today's money. Finally, he agreed, but with one condition. I will set him free, but if he start ransacking houses again, I will not be lenient and will not think twice before punishing him. If I were you, I would keep an eye on him. The mayor released him and the father escorted Sartuka 
to his new home. Satoka entered the house, still bloody and sweaty. The merchant's servants bathed him in scented water and dressed him in very expensive clothes suited for a royal prince before being sent to meet Prince's brother in the mansion. Being sent to meet Princess Badra in the meantime, Badra was waiting for his soulmate. She had also bathed in scented water, decorated herself with jewelry, and wore a ravishing outfit. She could feel her heartbeat in her mouth as the handsome Satuka walked in through the door. A few days later, they got married with a massive wedding. Satuka was given all the luxury and comfort in the mansion. For barely a week, they lived happily together. Satuka, being his deceived and kleptomaniac self, had other plans. Although they were married, Satuka was not committed to this luxurious life. What he wanted was to go back to his old reckless life filled with the thrills and breaking the law and doing all the unwholesome deeds. He wanted to use her, steal her fortune and run away, never to look at her again. One day, they were cuddled up comfortably together in the mansion and Satoka, having already schemed a plan, looked this as an opportunity to execute. He told Badra, my beautiful sweetheart, something in my mind continues to bother me. Would you like me to tell you? In a happy, bubbly mood, Father replied, Yes, my love, please, I would like to hear it. I don't want anything to bother you. Speak freely, nothing you should hide. So, Satoka said, You remember that I've been sentenced to death when I was taken. I prayed to the gods living in the mountains that if they could allow me to live, I would make an offering to them. I believe that is what brought you to me. You changed my fate and I was given another chance to do right. So, sweetheart, as I'm still alive, and have escaped that horrific death, I would like to make that offering to the gods. As a faithful, loving wife, Badra wanted to help him, having no idea what he had in mind. The next day, they got up together and helped one another to prepare themselves to go to the journey. Satoka had requested his beautiful wife to wear all her fine jewelry with precious stones, gems and diamonds. And he wore the most expensive clothes he owned. Everything was going to plan. But when they left the mansion, the merchant stood there, eyeing Satuka. Satuka stood there as innocently as possible. The princess told her father where they were going and their intentions, and her father approved. However, wherever they went, they were not going to be alone. The merchant has sent an entourage to help them and keep an eye on them. Satoka thought, 
with all these guards around my plan they fail therefore when they reached the bottom of the mountain he told badra he must do it by himself but only she could accompany him the princess understanding instructed the entourage to stay at the foot of the mountain and started to climb up the mountain with satyaka by his side at the top of the mountain they stopped something was making badra suspicious as love stuck as she was she still had her wits about her she could tell something was off something was just not right maybe it was the way he spoke that was different it was confirmed further when she, she tried to hold his hand for strength he briskly brushed it off as if he was guilty take it off take it off all the jewelry we need to make the offering these words echoed through the mountains and through herself she finally understood his intention with shivering hands she did what she was asked to do what would she do who knows what he would do to her with all the courage she could find she asked him husband what have i done wrong what is my fault the tears blistered in her eyes then satyaka said with a voice filled with anger fool do you think i came here to give offerings to the god i came here to take your jewelry even though we are married i never felt it every time i said i love you i lied i wasn't committed to our marriage i did have a good time while it lasted but my loyalty lies not with you but your fortune your fortune is the thing that i had my eyes on from the very beginning hand it all over to me now he shouted with anger but was devastated and heartbroken she knew that he wasn't just talking about the jewelry she was carrying she had more than this he could claim all her wealth if she died the pain was too much for tears ripping away at her sanity but she held on to the single strand of hope she had left she knew she was smart she knew she was strong minded and she knew that she could escape for as long as she stayed one step ahead of him the bravery filled her ferocious heart and the cogs in her mind were cranking up a survival plan she was discreet and thought of a strategy okay i have taken all my jewelry off dear husband i would like to worship you may i have your permission to proceed to do this ancient ritual let me worship you and then let me hug you from the front let me worship you from the behind and hug you from behind satuka underestimated badra who seemed to be an innocent young lady and agreed to grant her this final wish 
just as she said, she worshipped him from the front and gave him her warmest hugs, hoping it could change his mind. She looked up to see the stone cold unwavering eyes staring back at her. She looked at him as if asking for his forgiveness as he walked slowly behind him. He worshipped him from the back. And when he got up when she got up, she took a small run up and pushed him with all her strength. The push jolted him forward and towards the edge of the cliff. He lost his balance and there was nothing he could do to avoid his immediate fate and he fell over the cliff. She didn't want to look back. She didn't want to look over the cliff to see his dead body. But she couldn't have a faint smile as it occurred to her that this was the same cliff that he was sentenced to be thrown off before she saw him. The goddess that lived on this mountain witnessed this entire incident. She said, not on every occasion is the man the wiser. She is also very wise, but only if she takes a moment to think. It doesn't matter whether you are a man or a woman, young or old, whoever you think you are, you can only be wise if you take a moment to think. Badra used to acute intelligence and acted accordingly, which saved her. But something else happened at that moment. Questions started to appear in her mind. Questions of all sorts about the world, life, the universe. She began to question her every existence and the purpose of her life. The overload of questions overwhelmed her mind. Suddenly, all of that stopped and she became nauseous with the guilt of killing her husband. It felt as though her own life flushed in front of her eyes. The fond memories that they built and shared together tied with him. She convincing herself that she did it out of self-defense, but the idea that she killed someone made her sick. Throughout her entire life, she had never intentionally hurt even an insect, let alone killing it. She realized that it was not completely her fault Bad association and company had led her to this moment. She regretted their decision to let herself fall into the hands of bad association. Children, remember that if we fall into bad association, we will also make mistakes and choices that we will regret for the rest of our lives. So this young woman was consumed by guilt and she thought, how can I return home? That is impossible. Will they find out that I murdered my husband? Oh, how I treated my loving parents. I disobeyed them. I didn't think about how my actions affected them and now they will suffer for my actions. I cannot have that. I must go a different way and find the answer to all of these questions in my head. Suddenly, 
the answer prompted into her head. She stood up and looked away from the path she had come from and whispered to herself, I will ordain and went on a completely different path. She began her journey wandering through nearby villages until she found a monastery. Unfortunately, it was a monastery of a different faith. People were following a different sort of philosophy there because back in the time of the Buddha, there were many other religions and philosophies. This specific monastery was not of the Buddha or Mahasangha, but one of the other famous religion, religious leaders, Nigantanatha Buddha. Badu didn't know about the noble triple gem, but knew she had to ordain and change for good. She didn't want to be Badra anymore. Many others were practicing very strange rituals, but they didn't encourage her. So she asked to be ordained. She took a normal ordination and received the highest ordination that she could find in this monastery. Remember, I said that they were practicing very strange rituals. You see, one of the things she had to do to get this ordination was to give herself excruciating pain. One day, she decided it was the right time to leave the monastery. She became a wandering ascetic. She walked from one village to another, searching for answers. Whenever she met someone wise, she asked many questions and argued. Her questions were debated and everyone had different opinions. She would argue to prove her point until they accepted that she was right. In no time, she got the name the debating ascetic because no matter how wise the other person was, she would easily win the debate. After many debates, she began to believe she was undefeatable. Whenever she entered a city or a village, she would make a pile of sand and place a rose apple branch, otherwise known as Chambu. Then she barely announced, whoever willing to debate with me should trample this branch down. She would tell the children to spread the message. These debates were legendary, but always entered with Kundala Kesi winning. Going to one village after the another, and debating with others became her lifetime hobby. She was intelligent, but used her intelligence for wrong. She used her gift to build a reputation throughout the land, feeding her ego. But then she messed with the right person. One day, she entered the beautiful city of Savati. At that time, Lord Buddha was residing in Jaitavana Rama Monastery. As her usual routine, she again made a pile of sand and placed her iconic rose apple branch. She declared her arrival and made her usual announcement. The children who had gathered and heard about her looked her with respect ran through the streets and yelled the message to all four corners. At that time, great elder venerable Sariputta Thero, the foremost among monks with wisdom, was also in the city. He heard the shouting of the children and asked them to come. When the children saw the venerable elder, the faces lit up with glee. They told him about the legendary Kundalakesi and 
how she couldn't be defeated. They told him about the rose apple branch and how her competitors were fearful of trampling on it. Venerable Sariputta Thero understood what he must do. He had no intention to defeat the debating ascetic, but saw this as an opportunity to help her see the truth, to see the Dhamma. And as it was obvious that she was wise, she knew what needed to be done. Smiling, he asked the children to trample the branch for him. The children looked at the monk with surprise and went to find the rose apple branch to do his bidding. Smiling, he asked the children to trample the branch for him. The children looked at the monk with surprise and went to find the rose apple branch to do his bidding. After some time, Kundalakesi came back from her arms round her midday meal and was startled to see the branch had been trampled on and by the looks of it, it was trampled by children. With disbelief, she asked the children who trampled on the branch. They replied, telling her that the great elder Venerable Sariputta had asked them to do it. She thought, this great elder must be very intelligent because no one dares to trample my branch, let alone get children to do it on their behalf. There must be something special about him. He must surely be a great man. She was confident that she would beat him, though, but she knew it would be a challenge. She wanted everyone to see her victory and invited everyone to come and witness this debate. Around 8,000 families that live there came to watch this historical event. Ascetic Kundalakesi, followed by a large crowd of people, went to the presence of the great elder Venerable Sariputta Thero. They exchanged greetings. Kundalakesi asked, Venerable Sir, was it you who trampled my branch? If so, let us begin the discussion. With his heart filled with great compassion, Venerable Sariputta Thero agreed. He was asked the first question and he answered it perfectly without hassle. Then came the second and third, the same as before. He answered as if it were too easy. He kept asking and asking and asking away. He answered all the questions like a graceful swan swimming in a moonlight lake. Soon, Asadik Kundalakesi ran out of questions. She was astonished and dumbfounded by all the answers he had given. At last, Venerable Sariputta asked her, Great debatic ascetic, you asked me many questions. Will you permit me to ask you just one? Kundalakesi was puzzled. He answered all of her questions, but he was only going to ask one. He replied, Yes, Venerable Sir, ask me your one question. Venerable Sariputta asked, What is said to be the one? The one? Now, she pondered upon this. She thought, What could be the one? What it would, could it be? the ultimate God or the Maha Brahma? What is this one? Her head started to rub as she was thinking no answer. This was the first time 
that she couldn't give an answer to such a simple question. She was defeated. With her head hung low with embarrassment, she said, Very well, sir. I don't know what it is said to be the one. Then, Vandiba Sariputta said, Well, if you cannot answer such a simple question, how can you answer anything else? At that moment, her ego tumbled down and a simple question defeated her undefeated record. She was impressed and fell on to her knees at the feet of Venerable Sariputta. Venerable Sir, I seek refuge in you. Please show me the path and tell me the answer. Venerable Sariputta replied kindly, There's no point in seeking refuge in me. If you want to know the path, seek refuge in the infinite wise one, the great master of us all. He currently resides in a monastery nearby. Go to the Buddha for refuge. If Venerable Sariputta has this much knowledge, then how much wisdom must his teacher have? Quickly, I must go to him and find the answer to all my questions. Without no falter or hesitation, she worshipped the great elder with an abundance of respect, thanking him for opening her eyes and making her way to the Jetavana Rama monastery. The Buddha was at the front of a gathering and having seen Kundalakesi, welcomed her and started to preach the Dhamma. The same day, to understanding the world's reality, she decided she wanted to follow the path. She went to worship the Lord Buddha and the Lord Buddha reached out his hand and said, Come Bhadra. On that spot, she became a higher ordained bhikkhuni, a Buddhist nun named Vindrava Kundalakesi Theri. She listened to the teachings and practiced the path vigorously. Within a few days, she became an arahant. Soon after, the monks asked the Buddha, could it be possible for Vindrava Kundalakesi Theri to become an arahant? After listening to the Dhamma only a little, they also added that this lady had fought and won a victory over her husband, who was a thief, before he became a nun. Then the Lord Buddha spoke in the verse as follows Yoche Gata Satam Bhase Anatta Pada Sanghita Ekam Dhamma Padang Seyo, Yang Sutva Upasamati. Better than reciting a hundred verses that are senseless and unconnected with the realization of Nibbana. It is recitation of a single verse of the teaching. If on hearing it, one is calmed. Yo sahasang sahasena sangame manu se jine ekanta jaye attana save sangame juttamo. A man may conquer a million men in battle, but one who conquers himself is neither indeed the greatest of conquerors. Dear children, she finally realized the truth. She realized knowledge was not power, that learning is not the only thing we have to do, but she learned one line and upon hearing that, she was relieved from all suffering. Just think about it. She understood the Dhamma deeply and very quickly. For this reason, the Lord Buddha bestowed the title, the foremost among nuns, 
who is quick to understand the deep knowledge is my daughter Kundala Kesi. After attaining Arhanthood, she decided to travel up north preaching the Dhamma, healing the hearts of thousands of people for 50 years until she passed away. You see, children, she disobeyed her parents and watered her life to be how she liked it. However, she understood that the parents were right and their advice held considerable weight. Unfortunately, she could only understand it with experience. She was not a Buddhist at birth, but she became a Buddhist through understanding because she listened to her teachers and her elders because of her determination. She finally became an Arahant. You all know who and what the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha are. So, use it. Listen to the Dhamma and achieve the ultimate bliss. Be like Venerable Kundalakesi theory. May the Nobel Triple Champ bless you all.